Last week, we, um, we talked about the apostolic gift, that is the special gift that was given only to the apostles. You know that there are spiritual gifts in the New Testament that many, many people had in the churches, which gave them supernatural abilities. There was a gift of healing. There was a um, gift of speaking in um, unknown lang- or languages that they had not learned. There was the ability to prophesy. Um, and these things were gifts that um, God had bestowed upon many of the earliest Christians, but his 12 apostles had a special, unique gift um, that only they had. And uh, who can tell me what that was? The ability to bestow those gifts upon people. Okay. Now, does that mean, does that mean that the apostle had the ability to choose what gift would be given when he laid hands on somebody. No. The Holy Spirit made that decision. I think, Holy, Holy I think so God there you go. <laughs> okay, that's right. God made that decision. They were given the spiritual the Bible says that the spiritual gifts were given through using that Greek word dia, which which means um, uh, it's it it's used in reference to an agent or a um, Somebody that, do, or something that, that does something on your path. A tool is an agent. If I say I built a house with a hammer, okay, my hammer is actually, I could use that Greek word in reference to my hammer because it's, I'm the one that's actually behind it, but I use something else as a means to accomplish the task. All right, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Now that something else can be either an inanimate object or it can be a person. All right, it just depends on the context. So um, what Walter said was that God is the one who decides who gets what gift. They were given through the holy breath of God. That is that power of God, that extension of God into creation, because the Father is not here. (laughs) All right? Himself. He is much bigger than this room. All right, so... but. By his holy breath, his presence is here. And uh, he uses that as a mechanism through which to deliver the spiritual gifts to various people. But the same word, dia, which means through, an agent, is used of the apostles as well. So the, the spiritual gifts, if, if you will, come through the holy breath of God, which accompanied the apostles in their ministry, and then was given through the apostles themselves as well. All right, so it's kind of like a chain uh, or a conduit of the holy breath of God and then the apostles of God and then the recipient of the spiritual gift. All right, you you guys understand that, right? Okay, so the apostles themselves had a special gift, which was, which was that God had, or Christ had chosen them to be part of that conduit, part of that chain through which God delivers the spiritual gifts. So ultimately, who receives what gift is up to God. All right, He's the one who decides. It comes through this channel to that person. All right? All right, this is a very important concept as we look at spiritual gifts and how they work in the rest of the New Testament. This concept is is really critical so that we don't make some mistakes um, with regard to our doctrine. Now, what I want to do today is I want to go to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10 is another instance where the Spirit fell upon a group of people. Now, you may remember from last week, as we went through Acts chapter 8, um, the situation was Philip, who was not one of the apostles, he was one of the deacons, he went up to Samaria and he preached the gospel, and Philip himself was able to perform miracles, but when people were converted, he baptized them. There was no indication in any of the people that he baptized that anything supernatural was going on. That is, they didn't receive any kind of supernatural manifestations. However, they sent for Peter and John, who were in Jerusalem, who were apostles, to come up to Samaria And then when Peter and John came, they laid hands on those people who had already been baptized, and then they received these supernatural 
spiritual gifts. All right, that was the, that was the situation there. So what we see, what we learn from that account is that that was the normal manner in which spiritual gifts were being given. We talked a little bit about the grammar, if you guys remember that, where it says Simon saw that by the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was being given, which implies that it was the normal practice, not just in that one instance. Okay, <clears throat> So that's the manner in which these kinds of spiritual gifts, that is the Spirit falling upon people, was happening, was through the apostles' ministry. Now, when we get to Acts chapter 10, we have a unique situation. This is the first time that somebody has gone out preaching the gospel to Gentiles. Now, what about Samaria? Were those people Gentiles? What about the people Philip preached to? Were they Gentiles? What are Gentiles? Okay. The word Gentile. It's kind of a confusing word. It, it, actually, the Greek word is ethnos, from which we get our English word ethnic. What does ethnic mean to you? All right, in our, in our culture, it refers to what, what is commonly referred to as different races of people, right? If you go to the ethnic food section in the supermarket, they're going to have Hispanic foods there, right? Or they might have foods that are, you know, uh, uh, common to another, uh, yeah, Asian food, you know, whatever, all right? So e ethnos means it refers to a, um, and I hate using the word race because I've told you guys before that there's only one race and it's the human race, right? But people groups are divided up today by their ancestry, right, and from where they come from. And so they have different characteristics, just like we do here. So the point is, there are different ethnicities. And when you, you, when you see the word Gentiles in the Bible, it literally means ethnicities or the nations, because the nations typically, does, in the Bible, doesn't refer to borders of countries. It refers to the types of people that live in, in different places around the world, OK? So <clears throat> Gentiles refers to the ethnic people from a Jewish perspective. All right, if you're a Jew, you're the normal one, right? And everybody else is different than you. And so everybody else is the Gentiles or the, the ethnic uh, peoples of the earth that are not descended directly from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right. Now, what, who are the Samaritans? Because remember... When, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, and we went over his sermon in great detail, he was preaching to who? Who was he preaching to? Jews. And, what, and he was in the middle of Jerusalem preaching to Jews on the day of Pentecost. And remember, the day of Pentecost was one of the feast days, so the Jews were required to come from all over wherever they lived and come to Jerusalem in order to worship God. And so that's the group that he preached to, the Jews. In, in Acts chapter 8, Philip goes out and he preaches to the Samaritans. Now, who are the Samaritans again? Walter? Okay. The Samaritans were kind of a half-breed. They were half-Jewish and half-mostly Assyrian because the Assyrians had conquered that area and they had mixed and, and all that, right? And then you have... So, so the, the, uh, the Samaritans are those that are kind of half-Jewish they worship God according to the law of Moses, but they don't follow all the same regulations. They didn't worship in Jerusalem. They kind of had, had molded the or mixed their religion with the pagan religion. And then you had the Gentiles who were absolutely pagans. The Gentiles worshipped all kinds of foreign gods. They were polytheistic. All right. <clears throat> now, remember, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, in, in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus gave the commission to his apostles, what did he tell them he wanted them to do? All right, but there was a sequence. Uh, Stephen, what was the sequence? Jews first, then Right. There was a sequence. He told them to go to, he said he wanted them to be witnesses unto him in Judea, which is the headquarters area around Jerusalem where it was 100% or virtually 100% Jewish. To Judea, and then to Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, that is, all the nations. So this was the sequence 
that he commanded them, and this is exactly the sequence that we see playing out in the book of Acts. Peter, <coughs> excuse me, Peter preaches to the Jews, 3,000 are converted. Philip, shortly after that, goes up to Samaria. He preaches, and there's a large number that are converted as well. And now what we find in Acts chapter 10 is a large number of, of pure Gentiles, if, you, if that's, um, I guess, just like calling a, a dog a, a pure mutt, a thoroughbred mutt. <laughs> but but this, is, this is the case where we have nothing but Gentiles here. All right, so let's look. What I want you to see as we follow through this, I want you to see the, the struggle in Peter as he goes down to preach the gospel to people that are not anything like him at all. Okay? Nothing like him at all. All right, so let's start in uh, Acts 10, verse 1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Now, first of all, when it says um, that he was a centurion of the Italian regiment, what does that mean? He's a soldier. He's a Roman soldier. And what is a centurion? He is an officer, but what kind of an officer? Of what? That's right. Centurion comes from the same word as century, meaning a hundred. All right. A centurion is a commander of a hundred men, a commander of a hundred soldiers. So he's a very important, uh, fairly high-ranking man in the Roman military. All right. And he's living in Caesarea, which is on the coast, uh, the Mediterranean coast, kind of of where Israel is today. If you kind of, it's it's not too far from where you know where Tel Aviv is on the Mediterranean coast. It's not too far from there. All right. Anyway, here's what it says about this Roman commander. He was a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, and gave alms generously to the people, and prayed to God always. Wow. Now that's a pretty, a pretty good uh, description of a man who's a Roman soldier, isn't it? It paints a pretty good picture of this guy. Now, what does it mean that he was devout? Okay? He was devoted. He had a he 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 was not a you know somebody who didn't take their religious beliefs or their worship lightly, right? He took it very, very seriously. And he feared God. Now, it's not obviously it's not the Roman gods that he feared. Because here when it says he feared God, it's talking about the God of Israel. Right? The true the one true God. So this guy as a Roman. Now here's the thing you have to understand about Roman soldiers. They what they normally did when they would if they went into battle or something like that is they would offer sacrifices to the god of war or you know something like that, because they had a god for everything, the, the Romans did, right? And so they would offer sacrifices to various gods so that the, the battle would go favorably for them. But this guy was not like that. This guy was devoted to the God of Israel, which means he was not a pagan. But at the same time, he was probably not a full-fledged Jew either, or what, we, or what we would call a proselyte. That is, he had apparently not adopted um, you know, circumcision and the law of Moses and going to the synagogue and all that. He was... He was worshiping the God of Israel, but he was not doing it as a Jew. He was doing it as a Gentile. And that's a pretty remarkable thing, how he came to this place in his life that he, uh, he accepted the God of Israel as being the one true God and was fully devoted to him without actually converting to Judaism. And it's pretty remarkable, I think. What does it mean to give alms? What are alms? They are... Alms are donations to people who are in need, like giving to the poor. Uh, you know, if you see somebody who is destitute or whatever, you help them but financially. That's what uh, alms refers to. It's, it was a private matter between you and that person. And um, it's not something that you do to get credit for. It's something that was done in secret, normally. Anyway, it says, He gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. 
Now, what I want to point out is um, it, it doesn't say it here in verse 2, um, but it does mention another feature of this man's life. When Peter actually got to his house and he's telling Peter the story, he adds one more detail, and it's in verse 30. So I, I just want to point your attention to this in verse 30. It says, so Cornelius said, four days ago, I, notice this, I was fasting until this hour. At the ninth hour, I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing. That's the angel that appeared to him. So he was, not only was he praying to God always, he was fasting and praying, and it says he fasted until the ninth hour, which on Roman time would be nine o'clock in the evening. So he had fasted a whole, all day long until nine o'clock in the evening, and he was praying to God at that time. And so what happens? Verse uh, 3. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in, and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid, and he said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Wow, isn't that amazing? Here's a Roman soldier who's not a Jew, he's not one of God's people, you know, not one of God's covenant people, but yet God took special notice of this guy, so much so that he dispatched an angel to him to give him a message. So, verse, verse 5. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Now, what does that last statement imply to you? He will tell you what you must do. What does that imply? Yes, but what does it imply about Cornelius? He had been inquiring. It seems like the answer to whatever he was posing to God through his fasting and prayer, the answer would come from here. Yes, and, and it implies that he needed to do something. It implies that something was lacking for him. Isn't that right? He was imply, it was implying that I think you were right, Stephen, when you said he was inquiring to God, which was probably why he was fasting and praying. And I think, this is my opinion, because if we look at what happened after it, it seems, it seems to clearly indicate this, that he was inquiring because it wasn't enough for him to just worship this God that he didn't know and to just pray to this God that he didn't know. He wanted to know this God. See what I mean? There's a difference between reaching out to God and feel like you have, feeling like you have connected with God. Isn't that right? All right, so anyway, let's continue. Verse 7. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier. What does that imply about one of his men? He also was a worshiper of God, of the same God. You know, what I think is that this guy probably had quite a few men under him whom he had influenced so much that they were also following his example. At least one, right? All right. Um, verse 8. So when he had explained all these things to them, that is his two servants plus uh, the soldier, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, <coughs> excuse me, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. So Peter doesn't know anything about what's happening with Cornelius miles away. He's just, you know, he's here. He goes up on the housetop. That was common, by the way. They had flat roofs for, they hung out there in the evenings. Anyway, Peter went up there to have a little privacy because he wants to pray. And so what happens? Um, it says, um, at about the sixth hour, then he, came, he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And he saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. By the way, creeping things is a term that refers to reptiles. Okay, not, probably not a very delicious looking meal for Peter, who is a Jew who eats kosher. 
<laughs> and a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Now, he's talking about the kosher laws in the law of Moses, right? I mean, the Jews had very specific laws of what they could eat. They could eat fish, but they couldn't eat any fish. It had to have scales. They couldn't eat catfish, right? They could eat, you know, uh, four-footed animals if it had hoofs and not paws, and if the hoofs were split. If it, had, if it didn't have a split hoof like a horse, they couldn't eat that. Right? They had all these regulations. They couldn't eat pigs. They couldn't eat uh, all kinds of certain kinds of birds they could eat, but other kinds of birds they could not eat. If it was a a a, a, a car, if the bird was a carnivore, you know, like a vulture or an eagle or something like that, they couldn't eat that. Okay, it was very very specific. And then the way they prepared their meals was also very specific because this can't touch that. You know, uh, you can't have milk and meat together. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in the Law of Moses about, about uh, these kinds of foods. And so Peter, when Peter sees this in his vision, you know, the sheet comes down and it's got, I don't know, it probably had a crocodile. You know, I don't know what was in it. But it had all kinds of unclean animals to a Jew. And God's telling them, hey, Peter, you're hungry, right? Kill one of these and eat that. And that's completely contrary to everything Peter has ever believed his entire life. And it was completely contrary to what God had commanded Israel in the law of Moses. But he's telling Peter it's okay. You know, and Peter's, he's confused. <clears throat> so he says, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke to him again the second time. Notice this. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven. Now, what do you think this vision meant to Peter? Now, in a sense, it's, a meta, it's sort of metaphorical or allegorical vision, but it's, it's intended to give Peter a very important message. And the message had to do with the fact that there are some Gentiles on their way to Peter's house to ask him to come up to Cornelius' house and, and, and give Cornelius a message, right? So what do you think? I want you to interpret this vision for me. What do these unclean animals represent in this vision? Gentiles. Good. They represent Gentiles because... The Gentiles actually used the very same, I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, the Jews actually used the very same word to refer to meats that they couldn't eat and to the Gentiles, and that is unclean. All right? So, <clears throat> what was God telling him? By telling, by telling Peter, go ahead and eat it. It's fine. What was God telling Peter? If they represent Gentiles, what is he telling them? Don't look at them as being unclean. Because he says, what I have cleansed, don't you call unclean. Right? Oh. What does this, say? What does this imply? God is about to do a new thing. Right? He's about to do a new thing that he didn't do in Old Testament times. He's about to do a new thing, and that is to make the Gentiles clean and acceptable before God. Let me ask you something. Why did God give Israel the kosher laws? Why did he do that? It wasn't for their health. That's part of it. Was it for their health? <laughs> I know some people think it was. It was to draw but, a distinction between them and the Gentiles. Right. You see, when God gave them the kosher laws, it was after he called them to separate, be separated from the nations and to be a special people devoted only to God. 
What was wrong with having fellowship and communion with the Gentiles? What was wrong with that? That's right. Exactly. They worshipped pagan gods. The reason God told Israel, I don't want you to associate with the pagans. I don't want you to give your sons to their daughter, or excuse me, the other way around. Give your daughters to their sons, or have your sons take their daughters as wives, is because in a mixed marriage, what's going to happen? The worship of God is going to get mixed. Isn't that right? If the husband worships the God of Israel and the wife worships Molech, there's going to be conflict. And the conflict is going to be over how are we going to raise our kids? Isn't that right? And the kids are going to grow up not devoted completely to the God of Israel. And that's why God commanded it. It has nothing to do with genetics. has nothing to do with anything except God wanted his people to wholly worship him, and he wanted to protect them from idolatry. All right? That's the only reason. Now, why did he give him the kosher laws? To illustrate to them this principle, that, there, that when you belong to God, you must be separate from idolatry. Absolutely, completely separate from idolatry. These things do not mix. There must always be a distinction between what is clean and what is unclean. It's not because pig, pork is bad for you, although it might be. I'm not talking about that, right? I don't know. I like it, kind of, <laughs> depending on how it's cooked. But, <laughs> but that wasn't the point. The point was you are to be separate from the Gentiles. And so what did God do? He gave them a special diet that was completely different than what the Gentiles ate. And you know what? Eating together, most of you guys were at Stephen Cathy's house last night, and we ate together. And we had fellowship together. We had, you know, we laughed, we talked, we shared things, right? That is a kind of, of communion, a community together. And food, <laughs> you guys know this, is almost always... <laughs> the place where people gather and have fellowship together. It's around food, isn't that right? And that's why God separated their menu <laughs> from the menu of the Gentiles, because they could not go and have fellowship with Gentiles. They just couldn't do it, because what would happen if they did? They're going to serve up some food, and you don't know what's in it, and it's not kosher. Right? And so, because he gave them those laws, it forced them to separate themselves from the Gentiles and to keep them apart from having close connection and close communion with the Gentiles. And it was all for one very important reason, and that is he didn't want the pagan religions to be infecting his people. That's why he did it. In fact, Paul kind of says this, not in those exact words, in, uh, in Galatians where he says that God, the, why did God give the law to Israel? It was to fence them in until Christ could come to keep them from falling into idolatry. And, of course, we know they fell into idolatry anyway in many cases, but he did always have his uh, faithful remnant there as well. So what verse did I leave off on? Does anybody remember? Uh, 15, 16, 16, yeah. All right. Can I make All right. Yes, you may make an observation. Um, you know, when God gives all these different rules, these are opportunities for his people to practice self-control and restraint. Yeah. Paul in First Corinthians, we talked about last week, talked about the Jews as being those under the law, and the Gentiles are those without law. And when you don't fear God and you don't have rules that you have to abide by, there's no need for self-restraint. There's mm -hmm. no need for self-control. Yep. And so you see things descending into chaos and really focusing on uh, you know, the individual and what they want, what yeah. they desire, rather than having concern for and you can see what happened to the Gentiles in, in Romans chapter 1, where it says, you know, they were, their foolish minds were corrupted and they, you know, and all that stuff. But, all right, so th this is why God did all that. And so Peter, Peter still eats kosher because that's how he was raised his whole life. And for him to, for him to suddenly abandon that, 
you know, for you, it'd be like cutting off your right arm. I mean, it's, if it's something you've done your entire life, to change that mindset and to then put pork in your mouth, you know, Peter would probably have a gag reflex if he put pork in his mouth, even if it was, even if Kathy cooked it. <laughs> Nothing about your cooking, Kathy. I was complimenting you. I was, I was trying to find the epitome of good taste that even that would cause him to. Anyway. <laughs> All right, verse 17. Now, while Peter wondered within himself what this vision which he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for, Sim um, for Simon's house and stood before the gate. And they called and asked whether Simon, whose surname was Peter, was lodging there. While Peter thought about the vision, the spirit said to him, Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore. Go down, go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men and that had been sent to him from Cornelius, and he said, I am he whom you seek. For what reason have you come? And they said, Cornelius, the centurion, a just man, one who fears God and has a good reputation among all the nation of the Jews. That's another little tidbit of information. Uh, about this Cornelius guy. And it was probably because of his giving alms that he had this great reputation. Was um, divinely instructed by a holy angel to summon you to his house and to hear words from you. Let me ask you a question. Was it, was it okay for a Jew to go and stay at the house of a Gentile? No. Why? What would defile them? Would it just talking to a Gentile defile them? No, because you've been serving food. There you go. It's back to the food again. Because when, when, when somebody lodges you in their home, they serve you meals, right? And if, you, if a Jew goes and stays in the home of a, of a Gentile, they're going to give him food, and it's not going to be kosher. You know? and, uh, and that's a problem. And so Jews didn't do that. They just absolutely did not do that. Would it be okay for a Gentile to stay overnight or, you know, uh, lodge in the home of a Jew. Why? Right, he can eat anything he wants, and so if, the, if, they, if they feed him kosher food, <clears throat> so what? He might say, eh, this is a little bland, but, you know, <laughs> it's fine, <laughs> right? Okay, so what, is, what, is, what happens here? It says, um, um, where was I? Verse 20, arise, therefore, go down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Then Peter went down with the men that had been sent to him from Cornelius and said, Yes, I am he. I already read that. Verse 22. <clears throat> I read that too. All right, verse 23. Thank you. Then he invited them in and lodged them. Oh, he lodged them. Okay, no problem having Gentiles stay with you. On the next day, Peter went away with them. And I want you to notice this. This very important point. It says, And some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now, here's Peter. He's one of Christ's apostles. And when it says some of the brethren, what is it referring to? What kind of fellow believers? Jewish, Jewish fellow believers. Because at this point, you know, they're in Israel. This is in Israel on the coast. And, uh, and, and so the brethren would be referring to the members of the, you know, the congregation, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the Christians who were Jews who had been converted to Christ. And so Peter's a Jew. Those going with him are also Jews, even though they're Christian Jews. <clears throat> and then it says, um, uh, okay, verse 24. The following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. Now, was, it, was this inappropriate behavior? For one man to fall down and worship another man. But, you know, if you look at it from Cornelius' perspective, I mean, he'd been praying to God. 
He's wanting to get to know this God that he worships. An angel is dispatched to him. <laughs> That's pretty supernatural stuff there, right? How many of you guys would like to have an angel dispatched to your house and give you personal instructions? That'd be pretty awesome, right? So that's, that's pretty cool. And then he te- the angel tells him to go get Peter. He's going to tell you what you need to do. And so when Peter arrives, what do you expect from, an, from a man who was raised in a pagan culture, right? I mean, they, they actually had to fall down and worship the emperor who claimed to be a god. You know, that's the way the pagans, pagans did things. <clears throat> and that's the culture. All right, verse 27. Um, as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, <laughs> the very first thing out of this man's mouth, Peter's mouth, here is a big group of people gathered in a large hall, no doubt. They're all Gentiles. And here's Peter, a Jew, with a few other Christian Jews who have accompanied him over there, and there is this awkwardness. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? There's this, there's this, what we would call a racial awkwardness when you've got these people who all, all your life have been told that, you know, they're the elect of God, they're the chosen people, and you guys are Gentile dogs. That's how the Jews treated the Gentiles at the time. And now you've got Peter, a Jew, and these other Jews there in the midst of all these Gentiles. Awkward, okay? It's awkward. But, so what does Peter do? He breaks the ice, right? (laughs) He says, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation. What he means is go into their home and have fellowship with them. And again, it's because of the kosher laws. Um. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Hmm. You know, <laughs> when, they, when they arrived at Peter's house, Peter was pondering what the vision meant. But by the time they got there, Peter was pretty clear on what the vision meant. <laughs> Isn't that right? All right. Therefore, I come without objection as soon, or I came, excuse me, without objection as soon as I was sent for. I asked then, for what reason have you sent for me? And now Cornelius repeats the whole story about the angel. I'm just going to read that briefly, and then we'll continue to the last part of the chapter. <clears throat> so Cornelius said, four days, ago, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa and call Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, the tanner by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now, therefore, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. Wow. Verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. You know what I see in this this chapter? I see Peter learning some very important lessons as God is teaching him. God is bringing Peter and these other Jews through a sequence of events to wake them up to what God is doing as opposed to what they thought was appropriate, right? He's progressively showing them something. He's he's enlightening them. He's opening their minds and their understanding. And, you know, this is what we see throughout the entire book of Acts is we see these guys... You know, this guy Peter, you got to love him. He was always tripping over his tongue, you know, prior to Christ's crucifixion. He was always saying the wrong thing. Jesus was rebuking him, right? You know, and then he denied Jesus at the, at the time of the crucifixion. I mean, you know, he, he was, he was and, then he, and then he goes ahead and appoints another uh, apostle to, to supersede Judas without waiting for the presence of God to arrive. You know, 
but now on, in, in Acts chapter 2, we saw a complete transformation of Peter. He preaches a very powerful sermon, and 3,000 people come to Christ. But does that mean Peter has arrived, and Peter is, you know, he's got it all together now, and he's, you know, he's on the, he's on the right page? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. He's still learning, and he's, there's still more for him to learn. And this is exactly what Jesus said, you know, on the, uh, a couple of nights before his crucifixion. He says to these guys, he's, he was telling them that he was going away, and he says, you know, there's a lot of things I still need to teach you, but you're just not ready for that yet. That's what he said. He said, but when that holy breath comes, it's going to guide you and lead you into all truth. There was still more truth that they needed, and we see this developing here, and I think this is a, a very important passage to show that. All right, so let's continue reading. <clears throat> Verse 36. <clears throat> the word, this is Peter's words now. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. <clears throat> that word, or actually it's different. It says the word in verse 36, which is logos in Greek, but in verse 37 it's not the same word, even though it's translated that way. It's, uh, it's rhema in Greek, which means a report or a command or something spoken like that. And here it's talking about a report uh, because um, uh, he's saying to Cornelius that you have, heard, you have already heard a report about Jesus and all that's been going on with him, right? So he says, um, the word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That report you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, <clears throat> how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the holy breath and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we, that is Peter and the other apostles, we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of, of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses, and I want you to note the word witnesses in verse 39 and also in verse, I'm sorry, yes, 39 and also in verse um, 41. But to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us, who, and now I want you to notice this, us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. Wow. How can you, you know, he's, what he's saying is we have seen him crucified and we, we ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. A dead corpse doesn't eat and drink, right? It's a very powerful testimony, very powerful witness to the resurrection of Christ that Peter is giving here. And it's only, this kind of witness is only possible for those who actually were there who actually witnessed with their eyes what happened. Isn't that right? Right? And remember, we went over this last time. But we're, we'll, I'll mention it again in Acts 1.8, <clears throat> when Jesus said that uh, you will receive power when the holy breath has come upon you. And then what does he say? You shall be my witnesses in Judea, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. Do you see the linkage between the power, the external miraculous powers that were happening around the apostolic mission and the fact that they were witnessing? And then in Acts chapter, I believe it's 4 verse 33, it says that the apostles with great power, the apostles bore witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the resurrection. As the eyewitness testimony to the resurrection, that's why all these powerful, miraculous things were happening and accompanying the apostles as absolute proof from God that what they were saying was absolutely true, that they saw Jesus uh, rising from the dead. It's one thing for somebody to say, I saw something, but people can lie, right? People lie all the time. 
But when their eyewitness testimony is confirmed by God through supernatural signs, you can't argue with that. And that's the purpose of it. All right? Always keep those two things linked. These supernatural signs through the apostles are linked to their credibility for them personally as the eyewitnesses of Christ's resurrection. <clears throat> now, what we're going to see as we continue is a demonstration of that power follows Peter's sermon. Right after, he testifies to Jesus' resurrection. All right? Verse 42. <clears throat> and he, that is uh, God, commanded us to preach to the people and to testify. I'm sorry, Jesus commanded them. Uh, to preach to the people and to testify that he is he who was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, that is to Jesus Christ, the one who was resurrected, to him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. While Peter was still speaking, I mean, he had hardly gotten his testimony about Christ's resurrection out of his mouth when something miraculous happened. And what was it? While Peter was still speaking, these words, the Holy Spirit or Holy Breath, fell upon all those who heard the word. Now, what did I say fall upon means when we're talking about people receiving the Spirit? Remember, we talked about three different ways people are said to have received the Spirit in the New Testament. Right? There is this Holy Spirit falling upon them or coming upon them or being poured upon them. The verb isn't important. What's important is the preposition, upon. All right? When the Holy Spirit comes upon them, the Greek preposition is epi. And whenever you see that happening, it's always the same thing. They are receiving supernatural spiritual gifts. All right? <clears throat> so the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that is the Jews who believed were astonished. These are the ones who had come with Peter. Astonishment. Oh, okay, wait a minute. Peter was astonished at the vision. You know, now these guys are getting astonished again. Why are they being astonished now? <laughs> they had just come through Pentecost, right? I mean, it wasn't just weeks maybe, a month or two earlier, that they themselves had been in the upper room. And this power from God came upon them, and they started speaking in these other languages, right? Now, they, and it didn't happen to Gentiles. It just happened to Jews. So, you know, hey, we're the chosen people, right? We're the special people. And God was kind of busting that bubble for them. Because what happens is now we have an entire group made up of nothing but Gentiles, dogs, according to the Jews, and what happens? God gives them exactly the same gifts that he had given to the Jews just weeks earlier. Wow. That was a wake-up call, wasn't it, for, those, for Peter and the other Jews? <clears throat> they were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the holy breath had been poured out upon, or on, again, it's that Greek word epi, the Gentiles also, for, and here's how they knew that it happened, they heard them speak with tongues, that is foreign languages, and, and magnify God. <laughs> Same thing, it's Pentecost part two, right? Pentecost for the Gentiles is here in Acts 10. Pentecost for the Jews was back in Acts chapter two. But what does it show? The same thing that Peter concluded in verse 34 when he said, Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. Now, he concluded that because God sent him to preach the message to the Gentiles. That, you know, you guys can hear the message too, so God's not showing partiality. So why are they still surprised when God poured out his holy breath upon the whole crowd? Because now it wasn't just they were, you know, sort of like, second-class citizens who could hear the gospel, now they're equal with us. Equal, equality is what it's showing. And Peter is, and his fellow Jews are completely dumbfounded by this. And so what happens after that? 
What does Peter say? Peter answered, verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit or breath just as we have? <laughs> he shows that he understands the equality when he says just as we have. Pointing back to Pentecost. Right, he understands that now. Why does he say, can anyone forbid water? Why would he even use that terminology in this, in this context? I know Stephen thinks he knows. I saw his eyebrows go up and down. <laughs> what do you think? You're, you're right about all that, but that doesn't answer my question. Why does it say, can anyone forbid? Why would he use the word forbid? Why wouldn't he say, hey, let's baptize these guys? Why does he say, can anyone forbid water? What does forbidding imply? Stop. Opposition. Is that right? Opposition. If you're going to forbid somebody from doing something, you're opposing them. Isn't that right? You're stopping them from doing it. What does that imply about about the feelings or the thinking of Peter and the Jews, or at least some of the Jews maybe that had come with Peter. Do you, what's that? That maybe baptism wasn't for Gentiles. <laughs> well, you know, Peter knew it was because in his sermon he said so in, in Acts chapter 2, right? Because he said this promise when he was preaching to Jews, and he was talking about baptism, he said this promise is to you, and to your children and all those who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So Peter knew that baptism was going to go to the Gentiles, at least at some time, right? But what I, here's what I think. I think a lot of those Jewish believers that were with Peter, I think that there had been a little bit of a debate, maybe even on the way, as to whether or not they should baptize these guys. Because when it says, can anyone forbid water, it's Peter, what Peter is saying is, you know, you, we cannot, we cannot forbid these Gentiles from being baptized like we are. We can't do that. And why couldn't they do that? Because God had already absolutely demonstrated in amazing ways that he had received them as his, or was receiving them as his sons and daughters, just like the Jews, and that there was no longer any distinction. I shouldn't say distinction. I, I should say because there's always a distinction. I mean, the Jew and Gentile is a distinction. But there's no longer any inequality between Jews and Gentiles from God's perspective. All right, That's what he was trying to get across. And so that's why he says that. Can anyone forbid water that he should not be baptized? And what that also shows is that Peter and the other Jews that were with him, they were not prepared. They, Peter was, you know, he was going because he was supposed to tell him. He was supposed to give him the message. But it shows that they were not fully prepared to take that all the way and baptize them as fellow sons and daughters of God. They weren't prepared to do that until God had to force their hand, just like Walter said earlier. God forced them to do it by pouring out these supernatural signs upon them even before they were baptized. Now, here I have a question for you. Were they true Christians, sons and daughters of God, at the moment that these supernatural manifestations happened or when they were baptized later? Who says before? Who says after? Okay, it's after. The Bible is clear that it's at baptism that we become sons and daughters of God. All right? Now, what happened here is, and normally God doesn't give these supernatural manifestations to people who are, have not yet sealed the deal with him. But see, <clears throat> here's the thing. God knows our hearts. He knew these people absolutely were in their hearts and in their minds, were embracing the message that Peter was preaching. He hadn't even mentioned baptism yet. <laughs> he was still talking about who Jesus was, and they were absolutely on board with that. They were taking it in and 
in agreement with everything Peter was saying, and God knew their hearts. And so God kind of reversed the order of things that he, the way he normally did it in the book of Acts. He kind of reversed the order in this instance. And why did he do it? Because it's, it's, it's apparent here that these guys were not ready to take it all the way and baptize Gentiles as equals with them into the, into the, you know, the assembly of Christ. They weren't ready to do it. They, they were still, you know, they had their reservations. They still were debating the issue. You know, they weren't quite ready to do it. And God just basically, he just, you know, gave them a two by four upside the head. It's, you know, to where they had to follow through. <laughs> They had no choice. They had to follow through. And what we see is in the next chapter, when Peter, um, well, let me just finish this verse. It says, uh, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. See, now, if, if, it, wasn't, if it wasn't necessary for them to be baptized, you know, you could say, well, they already received the Holy Spirit, so they don't need to be baptized. But that's not how it worked out. It says he commanded them to be baptized, and they were baptized. It was not left optional here at all. And it's because I think Peter understood that there's a difference between God's power coming upon somebody and showing supernatural manifestations and that person genuinely being adopted into the family of God and being a son and daughter of God, according to the message of the gospel. All right? There's a difference between those two. And from the language that I pointed out to you before, when it says that the Holy Spirit falls upon somebody, it's not talking about their salvation experience. It's talking about outward manifestations of these supernatural things occurring with people. All right, whether or not they're already a child of God. All right, now, what happens in the... Uh, I'm going to take... I, I need five more minutes, so I'm going to finish this. Um, what happens is in the next chapter... Peter has to defend himself back in Jerusalem because they're all uptight about, about what he did. You know, I just want to read a few verses. Verse 11, or, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. <laughs> oh, you'd think they'd be all excited, right? Great, the Gentiles are being saved. Praise God, right? What will happen? When Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. <laughs> they started arguing with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter explained to them in order from the beginning, saying, now we're not going to read all that because it's the same story that we read in chapter 10, but I just want you to skip down to verse 15. <clears throat> Peter is still telling the story of what happened to his Jewish brethren back in Jerusalem who are arguing with him that he did the wrong thing. And here's what he says. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. There's that same language. As, soon, as, as at us at the beginning, or at the day of Pentecost. Just like, in other words, this was just like what happened to us on the day of Pentecost. And then he says, Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit or breath. If therefore God gave them the same gifts as he gave us. And I have to point out an a incorrect translation here. In fact, most translations have it correct. I don't know why the New King James doesn't. But the word we, there when it says when we believe, the word we is not in the translation. It's not in the Greek text at all. The translators added that, and it completely changes the meaning of the verse. <clears throat> Literally, it is, if therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when believing on the Lord Jesus. That is, when they were believing on the Lord Jesus, not when we were believing on the Lord Jesus. All right? Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? It's a pretty good comeback. When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. See, there was, this, there was this uneasiness, this debate in the church in Jerusalem about bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. And God absolutely put a stop to that discussion. And he did it at Cornelius' house by giving them the same kind of gifts that he had given to his own people, the Jews, on the day of Pentecost, giving it to them, 
so that they were absolutely forced to set aside their prejudices and move ahead with what God was doing. God had to get the apostles on board, get them on the bus. It's going to leave without you, you know, that kind of thing. 